Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, Times Insider exclusive event on uh, comedy and politics. Uh, my name is uh, Dave Itzkoff. I'm a reporter on the cultural desk of the New York Times. And uh, I'm going to quickly introduce uh, our three panelists who are joining us uh, to talk about the subject. And then they'll uh, tell you a little bit more about themselves. And uh, we will talk about where our worlds uh, intersect and why we all wish we could be doing each other's jobs. Uh, <laughs> so uh, just quickly to my left, so uh, Joe Miller is uh, executive producer and uh, showrunner, is that right, of uh, Full Frontal with Samantha B on TBS. <laughs> oh, terrific. And uh, to her left is uh, Sopan Deb, who is a culture reporter like myself on the uh, uh, a reporter on the culture desk of the New York Times. Yes. Uh, Carolyn Ryan unfortunately could not be here tonight, so uh, her understudy, Patrick <laughs> Healy, is here tonight. Uh, Patrick is a deputy culture editor and was recently a political reporter uh, for the New York Times covering uh, the 2016 uh, election. I feel like I'm in one of those Dr. Evil chairs. I know. I know. I'm, like, I'm, I'm going to pull on you to turn to you if that's yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm sitting like i got to stick up my butt, but it's because my mic pack is back here. <laughs> so, Joe, I'm going to begin with you. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about how you got to where you are professionally? Because you uh, did the not... scenic route. Yes, you did not take a traditional path uh, to comedy greatness. Oh, what is the traditional path to uh, comedy greatness? You know, usually people, they, uh, I don't know, they write for the... Harvard Lampoon, or they work in the uh, the comedy <laughs> clubs. You you went a little differently. Yeah, I took the long route. Yeah. Um, uh, well, before before this show, I was on The Daily Show for six years as a writer, and before that, I'd had pretty much every job in the world. Um, so, uh, start. I was you know after a wonderful career of temping and waitressing, I was went into academia. I was doing my PhD in medieval Jewish history and uh, eventually left that and um, embarked on a series of jobs from government consultant and uh, usability internet designer and uh, construction management and um, New York real estate. So I am actually <laughs> I am actually an insider in that business too. So like, Were you one of those people that like had your photo up before the movie went on? Like ask me about this property. <laughs> yeah, gold jacket. No, I was no, I was doing exactly the kind of gross um, like, you know, development marketing. So mm. uh, my boss was a like protege kind of of Donald Trump's but that's why I see this, like, you know, the, the revolve, actually the revolving door is gone. Now it's just an open gap right. between K Street and the government. I was like, yeah, of mm -hmm. course. Of course that's how a New York real estate developer thinks of government. You, right. Like, that's just normal. Right. What actually got you from that world to comedy? What was the, oh. sort of the first, like, real, uh, <laughs> like, transitional gig? Uh, that or, was working with Liz Winstead on her Wake Up World show. And Does anyone remember Wake Up World? Yeah. Um, I do. You do. Uh, <laughs> I think was, I wrote about it for the time. That was a lot of fun. We have some of them working in uh, at Full Frontal now. Yeah, so. and I mean, tell people what that was because that was kind of a. It was. It, I mean, it was an interesting live experience. Yeah, that was yeah. You know, Liz Winstead, creator of The Daily Show. Um, the, her, it was a live uh, fake morning show, hosted yeah. by uh, her and this sort of vapid, Botoxed character, and uh, her co-host, and we would. Um, uh, interrupt it with news breaks, little news segments, and I wound up writing those because I don't think people thought they were fun. So that was <laughs> that was the preparation for the Daily Show. That's how I got there. I'm going to pull on you for a little momentum. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying to just spin you. you. <laughs> I realized as you were answering, I was slowly turning it away. Not, not deliberate, just physics was happening. That effect. <laughs> So, Pan, so you are uh, a recent addition uh, to The Times, uh, and before you were here, you were working for CBS News right. covering the Trump campaign. You were out in the field at the rallies and at the events. Tell us about what yeah. that was like. So, uh, I was an embed for CBS, so I covered the Trump campaign from start to finish. Um, when I initially was, when we initially made the um, Assignment, so to speak. I was assigned uh, Marco Rubio, um, Rand Paul, Lindsey Graham, and Donald Trump. And my initial reaction was, <laughs> "Well, I'm not going to see much of Trump, so right. I'm not going to have to worry about, much about that." Right. Um, 
And then very quickly, uh, I was on out with Trump. I was a group of about five or ten reporters that covered him from start to finish. Um, five network embeds and a couple of people from the Post, a couple people from the Times. Um, yeah, went to about more than 40 states with Donald Trump. Um, went to hundreds and hundreds of rallies. Um, it was unlike anything I will ever experience again in my life. Never um, say never. Right. right. Um, I will say his rallies were more like concerts than they were, um, you know, political events. Like he'd come out and it would be like, you know, Springsteen was taking the stage and he'd say, we're going to build a wall. And it was like Springsteen playing Born to Run. Right. And it was, um, <laughs> it was, um, and it was, you know, he, people would line up, uh, you know, at six in the morning in 10 degree weather um, and people would be dressed like him. It was like a concert festival. Um, <laughs> one, tape? Well, you know, <laughs> one time, um, the, I'll just never forget this, in South Carolina, one time um, a guy, he, Trump spots a guy dressed like him in like an arena of thousands and thousands of people, brings him on stage and he says, uh, who are you? Oh my God, you're dressed like me. Uh, is your wife here? Uh, yeah, yeah, my wife's over there. Um, is she satisfied? Uh, and, uh, and the guy's on stage for thousands of people. I said, yeah, I think so. And, and, uh, and Trump goes, Trump goes, um, that's probably because she's thinking about me at night. Whoa. Uh. <laughs> and, um, and it was like that, like every day. Right. Now picture that, except hundreds of times. Right. And that's what the experience was like. But people would laugh. Oh, that yeah. Oh, no. Was, they loved could, it. He's like a stand-up comic up there. He could is, do no wrong. To totally. Know? They were loving it. The guy loved it. It was, you know, it was, he's bringing babies on stage. I mean, it was, you know, uh, wild, wild west up there, yeah. you know? Yeah. No teleprompter. You know, it was really something. Well. Right. Like near the end, there was a teleprompter. Yeah. You know. <laughs> but even then, it was just more like a yellow light, where it was like a suggestion for what he was supposed to say. Right. But uh, yeah, certainly an ex interesting experience. Right. And and you gave that up for what reason? Why did you? Do that? <laughs> <laughs> you came to the Times because <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, for many reasons. But uh, the first of which, I mean, it was an incredible opportunity, and I felt like. Um, you already have the job. You don't have yeah, the right. <laughs> right. But I felt like there were a lot of things that I wanted to write about, and culture offers me a chance to do that. Whereas when you cover politics, um, it's a little bit of a narrow. You're, you're, it, there's very little. It's almost like there's very little creativity in it. You know what I mean? There's very little. Um, you're very much driven by a guy's Twitter account, press releases, and you know, and that kind of stuff, and the schedule of this, you know, of the White House. So Patrick, let's talk. Uh, you, uh, I, you and I knew each other when you were a reporter on the Culture Desk covering uh, the theater and Broadway, and then uh, you got stolen back into the political world, and uh, you were keeping pretty uh, busy uh, this year. And I mean, talk about what your experience was like in the campaign uh, as you saw it. Yeah, I um, uh, in 2004 I covered John Kerry's campaign, and in 2008 I covered Hillary's uh, campaign. Similar to, to Sopan, I was the trail reporter going out every day. This time around, I was one of the more kind of what they call sort of overview reporters. So I was covering all of the debates, um, all, I think, 40 primary debates and, um, yeah. and uh, then primary nights and kind of all of the kind of the big breaking news stories. So we had like an investigative team that was looking at Trump's taxes, uh, the different foundations, uh, Trump's business dealings. And I was doing more of, I kind of like the sort of the in the moment stories. I mean, the the weekend that um, you know that the uh, the Billy Bush tape came out last uh, last fall, where Trump was captured on mic uh, saying the incredibly offensive things that that he did, and then tried to sort of dismiss it as sort of locker room talk, as if it's like jokes that men you know just tell each other, and that's all it is. Like I was writing that story, so you sort of pounce on things, and you're uh, oftentimes deciding in the moment, you know, how to treat those moments, you know, how grave, how seriously to take them. Um, with Hillary Clinton, you know, she had a much tougher time with with humor in a lot of ways, and I think that had to some extent to go with uh, how we perceive women when they're uh, trying to tell jokes or sort of deploy humor strategically, but. During uh, when she first started running, and the revelations came out about her private email server, she tried not to laugh it off, but she tried to use humor 
uh, to, to talk about it, and she just had a ton of bricks come down on her. And, you know, you had to sort of read, I, you know, I read misogyny into some of that reaction. I read, um, you know, very much, a, you know, some real sort of like gendered sort of feedback that came into it, but also a sense that, that politicians are, are quite bad about using humor yeah. sometimes. See, she in should moments. have asked, is your husband satisfied? <laughs> there you go. Right. That kills. Right, that kills, right. <laughs> really terrific. Improv though, yeah. that's the thing. I mean, you came up in the improv where it's a, you know, yeah, they don't know sometimes or at least Trump had a better sense, I think, about improv, certainly than he Hillary. can read a room. Oh yeah. He yeah. can yeah. read I think he smells a room. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, Joe, you know, one thing that we're seeing now, I mean, particularly since the election, is just, I think, a tremendous appetite for <laughs> topical comedy on television. Evidently, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, the, are you, we're being told that the ratings are way up. Yeah, I, I mean, the I'm being told that, too. Yeah, I hope it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how does that translate into just day-to-day -day how you and your colleagues are doing your job? Do you feel like... The mission of a show like Full Frontal has changed or adapted at all, even just since since the election. Now, unfortunately, it hasn't changed. <laughs> we were really looking forward to a change and to getting out of that mode of intense coverage of um, a, you know a train wreck unfolding in real time in front of us. And uh, we had all these great things. We wanted to get back to the states and cover you know more. Um, you know, cultural, medical science issues, um, you know, farm issues, all kinds of things, foreign things. And, um, you know, I, <laughs> when Jacob Weisberg realized that he was going to have to keep doing the Trump cast, that, like, you heard in his voice that he wanted to eat a bullet. <laughs> that, that I, I felt for him because I realized, like, we're not going to do any of that. We're not going to do this great thing on the bikini asshole that we had. We're not, you know. Right. Does it feel... I mean, to have that kind of a, a, a focus and a sense of purpose, I mean, is it invigorating? Does it feel kind of like uh, time to make the donuts? I mean, you know. No, it's, um, it, it, I mean, there, there's so much to do that the, the, the task is, is selecting and narrowing it down because there's way too much in a week. I mean, there's too much in an hour. You go to the bathroom and it's like yeah. you just came back from vacation. It's like, oh, what did I miss? Mm. Um, so it's it's selecting and maybe you know distilling the whole narrative into a common thread or something each week, and that's very interesting and fun. But you know, going into it, that whatever you know, we'll write something on you know Friday or Monday, and you know it's going to get thrown away. Uh, mm. You know, ninety percent chance. And it used to be that only happened when you know a Supreme Court justice would die, and now it's right. like a Supreme Court justice dying every week. Right. Do you, you tape during the day on Wednesday? Wednesday right. yeah. So by the time you know, I mean, you're, you're loaded into the prompt room, and you're hoping basically. I don't, you're hoping there's no news between Wednesday afternoon and Wednesday evening that by the time you're on the air you have as but fresh a show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, have you had nights where, I mean, you're literally rewriting either on a Tuesday night or a Wednesday morning to, you know, account oh, yeah. for things that have changed? All the time. Really? All the time. And then sometimes we just get in right under the wire, like we did that whole animation. Um, about the you know House Intelligence Committee, and it was like eight hours later, the the chair was recusing himself. Like, whoa, we're glad wow. we got that under the wire. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you feel like you made that happen. You, your car your cartoon is like that. That's how high the ratings are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you think that what Full Frontal does is, in its own way, some like a form of journalism? No. Not at all. <laughs> no, we rely on dirt. This is See, fun. Yeah, conservation momentum. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we rely on the work of actual real journalists, and um, thank God for them. I mean, there are times when we'll fill in when there are people who haven't talked to any journalists, so we'll go and talk to the women who've had experiences having miscarriages at Catholic hospitals, for instance, or women who have been sexually harassed on cruise ships. So um, if we, if there are people whose story we want to get that haven't talked to reporters yet. We'll try to do that and fill it in. Um, I like getting Scott Holcomb's story of how the rape kit bill got passed. But no, I mean, we wouldn't know about these stories except for the work of actual real journalists, especially local um, reporters that get Tampa Bay Times and the Charlotte Observer and um, right. Channel 11 in Atlanta. Right. But when you, let's say, I mean, when you have Sam, let's say, talking to somebody like Masha Gessen or you have her go out to, you know, meet with Russian trolls. I mean, that is... Oh, yeah, that was. Yeah, yeah that was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I mean, we weren't the only ones talking about the Russian troll. But, right. um, but you're getting out into the world. I mean, you're going, you're out collecting information and bringing it back to people. I mean, that is a kind of... Sometimes. Uh, Mostly we're commentary. Right. Sure. But you also, the, the, your audience, sometimes that's the only way that some people are going to learn about those stories. I mean, there are people yeah. who watch, you know, Full Frontal or, or The Daily Show and, and they don't read the New York Times or other outlets they go to. Well, that's yeah. when I, I do like when we're able to bring people something like the Catholic hospitals or the rape kits that's not, that hasn't really gotten breakthrough coverage that they might have mm. missed. You know, when you're doing a story like that, you know, it's not like your writers are sitting around saying, you know what would be really funny to talk about? Rape kits. Yeah, miscarriages. You know, you know, right. <laughs> so on some level, you are doing some sort of journalism because those aren't funny topics per se. Those are, you're, you're delivering information yeah. on some level, right? Yeah. So, and which is a different choice than say what Jimmy Fallon does. You know, Jimmy Fallon's, Jimmy Fallon is not trying to be a journalist in any, any no, no. you know, not really. No, it's, I mean, which is fine, that's a personal fine. choice, you that's know. That's a different, yeah. Okay, yeah, <laughs> okay. I wonder for Pat and for Sopan, I mean, as, you know, as, as, you know, the journalists on this panel, I mean, do you ever look at the late night shows and in some way feel, you know, a tinge of envy at what they do in terms of how they tell their stories or, you know, the kinds of, vocabulary that they can use. I don't just mean like the four letter words, but just the, you know, the range of ways that they can, you know, bring people in that maybe aren't always uh, available to us in how we tell our stories. Is there something we can learn from them? I wouldn't say envy it. I would say that it's information. It's interesting what works and what doesn't work. Um, I, I'm also particularly fascinated by the approaches the various late night show hosts take. So for example, uh, I'm fascinated by the fact that Jimmy Fallon is someone who, um, you know, he's not going to be aggressively taking on Donald Trump, um, whereas Stephen Colbert, you know, Sam B, uh, you know, the, those guys will. Um, Oliver. John, right, John Oliver and right. Trevor Noah, of course. Um, and Jimmy Kimmel, I think, is kind of in the middle of that, in that range. And that approach kind of, and, and it's interesting to see what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. Um, yes, of course there are lessons that we can learn in terms of, okay, this is a funny thing that they did, but maybe there's some storytelling we can take from that as well. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think we are kind of working towards that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Somebody but, like Seth Meyers who can do now these long, you know, nine, ten minute segments sure. on a single topic and they're long and dense monologues and they're, you know, I mean, they're, they're pretty fastidiously fact-checked and they're, you know, full of, you know, real information, but he's also found a way by you know leavening it and throwing in you know a one line or a good visual here and there, and that's a way to make sure that people's attention is sustained through what can sometimes be you know very uh, you know challenging material or something that you just would otherwise. Well, I mean you know, Oliver is the master, yeah. I and mean, he's giving yeah. people a civic education that, that they didn't get in school. Absolutely, but, um, and and it's still John Oliver. It right. still has his voice. It's still mm -hmm. his brand. It's not yeah. like it doesn't feel forced or. No, um, and it's great. Yeah, and it's not the. You know what? What John Oliver does is is a, I, I think of as a, a somewhat close cousin to what Rachel Maddow does sometimes on her show. Absolutely. What, what yeah. Chris Hayes does in terms of taking video and building, and Seth Meyers does this as well. So you know, build through video, building a very powerful narrative essentially with with commentary um, that that tells a real story in a memorable way. I wrote, a, when I was covering politics here, a lot of stories that we call news analysis. So there's like the straight news story, um, you know, Donald Trump said yesterday, blah. And then there's an analysis. And I, I, ha I do have envy of, of what I think Sam and Joe do really well on Full Frontal and what some other shows do, which are commentary and analysis can be a, a fairly close line. And I think that you can, Get a lot of narrative power through through humor and storytelling, and <clears throat> reference so sort of social reference points that um, you know that I think Sam does very well. And we tend to be sometimes just the gravity of everything has a, a straitjacketing feeling. Like this is so important, and we're so serious, and the voice of the New York Times has to sound a certain way. And it was something we were often fighting against. But those news analysis stories, um, I often thought, you know, sometimes when I see late night, uh, when it's done really well, I think, you know, that um, we, could, we could definitely draw things from that. Yeah. We, we keep our collection, our, our New York Times shade file. Uh, <laughs> what's that? Oh, that's yeah, it. New York Times 
throw some really good shade. Uh -huh. like, oh, okay. Like, yeah. Oh, okay. So it's not it's, shade on the New York oh, okay. Times. No, no, no. Okay, it's, it's okay. New York Times, like, it, like just subtly and gently deploying. It's, it's a special brand of New York Times shade. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it feels like to me. Just the, we got a file. In the last <laughs> year, in the last year or so, one of the biggest shifts that's happened in late night is that these shows, you know, with a couple notable exceptions are no longer just comedy shows. They don't aim to be just comedy shows. Um, and I, may, I mean, of course I may be wrong about this, but you know, it doesn't feel like when I'm watching Seth Meyers, when he's doing a 10 minute segment, you know, a, cl a closer look at uh, Donald Trump's ties to Russia, it doesn't feel like that's aimed for just comedic effect. Well, we never yeah. were. I mean, The Daily Show was sure, and, and doing this for years. Right, right but, it, but when John, John Stewart was doing it, it, he was kind of not the only person, but he kind of, was the best known for, but now it feels like a lot more people are doing what he was doing. Uh, what were your Since years like at, the, at that show? And I mean, did you, did you, do you feel like you saw an, an evolution of any kind just in terms of what, you know, a change in the mission of the show, or was it always pretty consistent? Well, time? yeah, I mean, every, every year, John, you know, John was raising the bar every year, every sure. day, so that's, um, <laughs> Trayvon is here with me. We got a little tired of people telling us how easy it used to be and how there used to be <laughs> naps and things. <laughs> <So> <laughs> like, what? Naps. Um, and so he always challenged himself to do more. And, yeah. and those were the, the pieces that I always jumped on and wanted to work on were like the world of class warfare, the ones where he had his teeth in something and really had something to say. Yeah. And being able to research those um, and do these multi-part Theme things like the you know the the war of the you know sneering privileged class on the poor. Um, right. uh, those are the ones that he got the most satisfaction out of. I did too. Um, did you do any work on? I mean, one of the one of the projects or one of the uh, pieces of legislation that was intensely you know important for him was the Zadroga Act. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that mm -hmm. seemed to come wholeheartedly out of something that. You know, he cared about and Very was interested deeply. in. I mean, was that? Did you have any involvement in there? You just oh yeah, of... Hallie and I would write whole scripts, and then he would throw them out in ad lib. Oh. <laughs> 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 to be like, he thought that was you know, and I think right. agree is but the way to be the most respectful to the um, the people affected right. was to just be real in the moment. So right. right. Uh, so Pat, I mean, you uh, people may not know this. I mean, you are a practicing stand-up comedian as well. I mean, outside of the times, but you perform stand-up, and, and do you find that, I mean, are these totally different worlds for you, or do the skill sets translate any way? Do they sharpen one another at all? Yeah, you know, uh, when, when I'm doing stand-up, um, are you again? Uh, when, I, when, I, when I'm doing stand-up, it's, uh, you know, I like to think, talk about things that are very personal to me, and, you know, if you go to a, a random show, you know, there's, it's not a monolithic group. You're gonna talk, you're gonna have one person that's talking at length about just observational humor. I was on the subway today and my God, the person that was grabbing the pole was just such a jerk. You know, and then, um, that's not me by the way. Um, you know, but for me, um, I, I, I talk a lot about, you know, growing up Indian and never, you know, not being particularly close to my family and, you know, and, and talk about, it's, for me it's a lot more of a personal brand of comedy um, I've never been particularly that interested in doing political comedy, like as a stand-up. Um, not because I don't have things to say about it. I'm just not sure that I could make it funny enough. <laughs> you know. Um, I read your Twitter. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, there you go. Um, it's very funny. Um, but uh, for me, that's not the reason I do stand-up. Not everyone does stand-up for the same reason, of course. You know. Um, there's reason that Chris Rock does it. The things that he ha he wants to talk about are different than what Jerry Seinfeld wants to talk about. And so for me, I just was never all that interested in trying to you know delve into what I think about Donald Trump or anything like that. Right. And Pat, when you're covering the campaign, and I mean, you were talking before about sort of seeing it, you know, I mean, almost at like an atomic level, at like mm. point blank range, and you know, I mean, there are so many stories that you're covering because of just the nature of what they are that were, you know, I think kind of. Uh, you know, they, they take a psychic toll after mm -hmm. a while. I mean, were you ever able to step back and see any humor in what you were writing about? Oh, that's they... a great question. Um, I mean, the debates got surreal by the end of the, by like the 10th, <laughs> you know, Republican primary debate. I wanted to ask you about that. What was that like <laughs> for you when they just failed to come out? <laughs> when they didn't come that one yeah. time, all right. It was, it was, we always were wondering what was gonna happen because they were all so 
angry at Trump. So like every, by, like, by like the second or third debate, and so we always thought someone was gonna pull something on him, like in some way. And, and then like when they, the gag that night or when a they, gun? Like a like, gag, well, fair <laughs> question, you know. Um, you know, or like trip him or something, I don't know. <laughs> like, like sort of like pushing, the, you know, they wouldn't have done that, yeah. but it would have been, well frankly, they, and then the flip side of that though is that they never showed real personality. I mean, that would have required, showing a, some kind of sense of humor would have required showing you know, something toward a personality. And the, the one who had sort of the, I think the most comfort around that was Lindsey Graham, who was a very I sort of him. funny guy. He's, he's genuinely he funny. funny. He's funny. Like if, Lindsey yeah. Graham, he if Lindsey Graham oh. pursued a comic, a career in yeah. comedy, right. I actually <laughs> very legitimately think he could he could make it. You guys need to contact Lindsey Graham and tell him to please come to the White House Correspondents Dinner. We really want him. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I am a genuine Lindsey Graham fan. We were, he was, I mean, I have to say, like, he was my favorite dial a quote. I just, mm -hmm. I always wanted him in the story. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible. But no, it was always, we were always hoping Lindsay would make it from the JV debate up mm -hmm. to the main debate. Yeah, me too. Because you could go, instead you had like Chris Christie and like Marco. Oh, God, oh, no man. sense of humor <laughs> with these guys. No, but I mean, to your question, Dave, yeah, it would sometimes, um, you know, the shell shock hit, you know, would set in after a while, just covering so many of these events. And, um, and, you'd find yourself, like I was sort of getting at before, taking it all so se sort of seriously. And, and it is the future of the country and the presidency. And I felt like I had a responsibility there. Um, but at the same time, it was frustrating because you felt like you, were, you weren't covering the sort of the humanity of the politicians as, as much. Um, you know, especially it was a huge challenge with Hillary Clinton because by, the, yeah. by 2016, the access was so limited mm -hmm. to her and, and we were all trying to put her on the couch yet again and kind of do these sort of personal pieces. And um, I think you saw the media's, you know, preoccupation with her, uh, with her private email server almost became like a proxy for the stories that we couldn't write, which were about this Hillary, how does she see herself? Does she see herself as someone who, is an imperfect character, and that's interesting. And that was a tough story, man. That was a that was a tough one. I, I will say, covering Trump and seeing as many Trump rallies as I did, um, it wasn't hard to find humor, um, and because he has such a singular way of speaking, and so at every rally you'd have these little what I used to call Trumpisms, yeah. and like he'd say things like. You know, one time he was talking about, uh, the, he, he once made this claim, uh, you, I'm sure you all remember, about thousands of Arab Americans dancing on the rooftops. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the weeks after that, he's defending it and defending it, he goes, you know, when I first said that, nobody believed me. Well, some people believed me. Actually, everybody believed me. <laughs> and it's like when you hear things like that, you're like, well, how, how, that's funny. How could like, you? Maybe a rope. Like, he would just say, he say things in that Donald Trump way, and you just couldn't, not laugh at it. Well, Even can, I, I, yeah. can I follow up on that? I mean, we had, this is, I'm telling something a little bit out of school, but there was one point during the primary when we had a discussion about whether we should write about how funny Trump was. And it was during the primary season, it was still unclear whether he was gonna be the nominee, but the way he was deploying little Marco and Lion Ted, <laughs> Lion Ted. there was a group of us in the Times who found that to be fairly funny. Mm -hmm. And especially the way Ted Cruz, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Ted Cruz. Ted, Ted Cruz. Ted See what I mean? I mean, yeah. I mean lying yeah. Ted was just, I am sorry, and it was we, very funny. We made and it the, into an internet meme. We, like, we cut out Lion Ted and like, had people Photoshop him into settings and stuff. Right, no, exactly. And, and to make fun of Chris Christie's eating habit, I mean, this is low humor. Yeah. Like, you know, this is, but it was, and we struggled with it because we thought, Again, there's so much discussion now about normalizing Trump and treating him as sort of a normal figure. If we were to write a straightforward story that just was like, the guy's got a sense of humor, it's his own sense of humor, you may find it funny or not, but he shows it, and these are some funny lines. Like, would that have been giving him such an epic pass, you know? Yeah. And ultimately, we didn't write that. I think others did, right. but we, we kind of stayed away I mean, as he is somebody who, you know, I mean, he is a creature of television. He was a reality host, as we know, and he's clearly spent years and, watching and TV. And he's on Howard yes. all yeah. the time. Yeah. He's been in our living rooms for like 20, 30 years. Right, right. He's, you know, he's, he's 
so, very familiar to the American right. but this, But so, Joe's point yeah. is important. Yeah. Howard Stern, he worships Howard Stern. I mean, yeah. he considers him a very close friend, but he also, uh, he would talk to, I remember two distinct conversations in which he asked me if I'd, I was listening, because we would talk, you know, pre, you know, not regularly, but, but periodically, and he would say, did you hear Howard this morning? You know, on this, and Howard Stern's a really good interviewer. He's, I mean, I'm, a, mm -hmm. you know, a fan of his, but he he worshipped him, and he, and to Dave's point, he really did, I think, understand the power of humor and storytelling, and how that is memorable with voters, and especially at and that five point pitched plans at that level, him. that very sure. broad yeah. appeal of sort of guilty pleasure for some of us. Yep. And Sam and I are both Howard Stern fans, like giant feminists, also like Howard Stern. <laughs> so. um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he tweeted this morning, for example, he wrote, uh, you know, uh, a great book for your reading enjoyment is Reasons to Vote for Democrats by Michael J. Knowles. And people may know this, this is a book consisting entirely of blank pages. Yeah, David, <laughs> and this been, yeah. You know, David, David from tweeted that. And, yeah. uh, but he also said that um, that was like an hour after the author was on Fox at 7.15. So this mm, was right. another one of those Fox feedback loops. Sure, yeah. sure. I mean, that, that part of it is, uh, it, you know, we could spend hours deconstructing that, but just the the premise of him, you know, I mean, it's he's sharing something that you know his base is going to get. It may not seem funny if you're a Democrat; it might seem like a little salt in the wound. But I mean, it is. It, it I mean, it's kind of funny, right? To to suggest that I mean, people read a book of blank pages. It's, I mean, that's a straight line. I mean, he just he just set up a straight line, right? For everybody. So he kind of it, so yeah. he, he was it wasn't a successful joke, or was it? I'm not saying it was a Huckabee joke. Right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's man. let's talk like, about that's Huckabee. A, that's, a good, that's a Huckabee plus, yeah. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I did bring. But that was just like I was on the crapper, and I saw this on Fox and Friends. Right. 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 <laughs> can I ask? Can I ask though? Because you three are much more masters of Twitter than I am. But one thing we always wonder about is how he uses exclamation points so often in his tweets. And I remember him saying once that he did that. For, he, I remember he used the phrase for comic effect sometimes, that like to do like sad exclamation points. It wasn't because, wasn't because in the Twitterverse you would think, oh, God, that's so sad. But that it, would, that, that it was done to sort of make people like uh, almost smile about I'm not putting it's words a, in his mouth. It's sort of a schoolyard taunt. That right. way. When well, there's an exclamation point, it's a like, you're gonna cry, you're gonna cry, baby. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. But he's he's kind of giving you like the like an emotional cue, like he's telling you right. how to feel. And there's but, something. Right. He's like, go go and read some real estate listings from subliterate like real estate agents. It's like all <laughs> exclamation points and creative right. capitalization, yeah, and right. they, they map pretty closely. <laughs> <laughs> Sad. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, just for this, and we talked about Huckabee, but just for some contrast. Now, here's something that he tweeted a few days ago. This is, uh, this is Mike Huckabee. Huckabee. This is a Huckabee tweet. You'll, you'll know it when you hear it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> got haircut today, asked for the Kim Jong un look. Barber, Barber refused, said it was dangerous to cut hair with a lawnmower. That's the tweet. You know, uh, this uh, was it. Was it Kimmel last week that had uh, Patton Oswalt come yeah, on and yeah. do mm -hmm. read Mike Huckabee's tweets as if they're mm -hmm. at, as if he's at an open mic? Yeah, um, and his <laughs> his bridges were so great. <laughs> and uh, I yeah, I, Mike Huckabee ran for president twice, uh, right. and uh, I. I, I for some reason, Mike Huckabee is, doesn't rate as well as Donald Trump does, I right. guess, on Twitter. But he is, he is, is everything that's wrong, because you're right, because Donald Trump is generally funny, and this is like comedy kryptonite here yeah. in yeah. human <laughs> form. And we, like, way, way back, we've been following him for a long time, and we wanted to start a podcast in our copious free time, just five minute podcast every week, deconstructing why each joke he made that week was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> just as a, a comedy writer's podcast, <laughs> we may still yeah. do it. I mean, there are there are you know the dad jokes, which are the ones that are just blatantly obvious. They're not even good dad right, jokes. Right. Like there's something. There's sort of a, a threshold below. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow. There's everything wrong. Like right. he just goes out of his way to punch down, and it's just yeah. yeah. Mm. I mean, talking about Trump, I mean, one thing that it, he, he does seem to understand, you know, uh, the power of satire, and we know, for example, how closely he follows what is said about him on Saturday Night Live. So on some level, he does seem to recognize that satire and humor are a way to 
communicate things to people and you can fly under the radar a little bit or you can get away with things that maybe wouldn't fly in a kind of, you know, a straightforward delivery or, you know, a kind of, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, I'm afraid of Stephen Bannon or I don't trust him. But if you literally depict him as the Grim Reaper, you're saying mm. something yeah. else. Well, I think he, he cares about that because of the ratings. Like, Saturday Night Live has, has a very broad reach, so he cares. He doesn't care, you know, he, the, what's the highest rated show on cable news? Like O'Reilly with three million viewers or something? Nobody's watching that. But people watch SNL, so he cares. Right. Mm. No, I think he, I mean, he, he guest hosted it during the campaign. And yeah. he, I remember talking to him about, a, uh, I, soon after it was announced that he was going to guest host him, because we were all curious, why are you spending time on that? It's sort of like a week off the campaign trail to get ready. Uh, I mean, he didn't spend that much time doing it. But, you know, he loved, he, at the time, he would say how much he loved the show. He'd always loved the show. That he, you know, he had such a sort of an understanding, I think, about about satire, especially when he felt like e either he could control it or it reflected pretty well on him. I mean, he, good God, I mean, the narcissism, well, should I say that? I don't know. But I mean, he, no, he, he loved what he saw as, as, as sort of flattery. Yeah. And, you know, he had a huge admiration for Alec Baldwin until he didn't. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> you know, and, and that show yeah. particularly, he was really honored you know, so he said to, to go on to it. And it, just like when he came to the Times soon after his election, and even though he talks about the failing New York Times, you know, in that room, he was gushing all this praise for, for the paper. And that's him to a T. Yeah. I mean, that's, he's a people pleaser in the extreme. Like, it, to your face, he just doesn't call you failing this or nasty that or whatever. He's a charming guy behind it. Oh, well, he's, yeah. yeah. He, turns, he turns it on. It's strange. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's Don't forget, thing. Trump um, has hosted WrestleMania. Um, <laughs> he was allowed himself be, to be the subject of a Comedy Central roast. Right. Uh, which, and I believe, if I recall correctly, uh, the only jokes he would not approve are the ones that said he wasn't, right, the jokes he about his wealth. He wasn't his really wealth, yeah, right. Like, if you said that he wasn't actually a billionaire, that's, mm -hmm. That that's was the, that's that's the only thing that's right. disallowed, yeah. So he does have this kind of history in, in, in comedy. He, wasn't he in Fresh Prince of Bel-Air for a, you know? He, he was on an episode you of know, it. Yeah, yeah. So he, I think in the Marla Maples era, he was. Right. <laughs> right. But, the, but the flip side of that is yeah. the thin skinness. I mean, it was yeah. the White House Correspondence Dinner that he was at where he was a guest, and right. President Obama was on the dais just mm -hmm. taking him apart. And he felt so humiliated in that. He could not mm -hmm. laugh about it. He could not see, oh, well, at least the spotlight's on me. I'm all anyone can talk about. Bah, 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 bah. Now, he was, he, Obama was so smart, and his speechwriters you know, spent a lot of time on yeah. that, on Thank, that piece. Thanks, Pod Save America, guys. You yeah. gave us <laughs> right. Trump. Right. <laughs> he gave us Trump. <laughs> right. And it was, I mean, you know, there'd been a lot of speculation did he decide to run then, but I, mean, I, just, I do think that was part of it. You can see the thought bubble. Of course, he decided sure. that. Like, Curious. <laughs> Curious. And also, like when Trump would, you know, and as someone who's done comedy, you know, he had a lot of the marks of a stand-up comic. He'd go on stage and he'd have a lot of the same takes. The crowd work, yeah. you know, the way, the just he's coming on stage with a set of instead of jokes, policy positions, right. but mixed in with jokes. Most jokes. You know, well, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but one of my one of my favorite things about watching Trump rallies where he didn't have a prompter is when he'd come to a conclusion that he didn't realize he had in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> so, and, and the, the, a great example of this is when, um, right at the beginning of when he's floating that Ted Cruz is ineligible to run for president, right? He says, he's born in Canada, I don't know if he's... And then as he's defending his rationale for saying that, because he's getting all this, all this criticism for, well, how could you be a birther again, and how could you do that? And, and you know, this has been settled. He goes, well, look, I'm doing this because uh, Ted Cruz might get sued by the Democrats if he becomes the nominee. And then he says in the middle of a rally, he goes, well, maybe I should do him a favor. Maybe I should sue him. I'm going to sue him. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, he, like, like this switch right. click where he's like, yeah. oh my god, I'm brilliant. I'm going to do this. Which is such a CEO thing. That's like CEOs sit, <laughs> they sit in the, um, you know, in the room and they just spin like that and everybody goes, great idea, boss. <laughs> you know, wow, it's really amazing to watch how 
how you come to your decisions. Right. <laughs> and to there, not have shareholders that you'd have to actually explain them to. Right. right. <laughs> there is that sort of stand-up comedian's device, though, of you know insulting somebody to their face, then you say, hey, you're all right. Thanks for coming up. And, yeah, right. you know, and you can, It sort of lets you, you can do both things at the same time. You can have your cake and eat it, too. You can decimate somebody. But then you sort of say, hey, you were in on that joke, too. Mm -hmm. And the person has no idea if they were just insulted or not. Right. So true. Yeah. Joe, I mean, you guys are actually, now you're, uh, Full Frontal is doing its own event yes. on April 29th, on the yes. night of the Correspondence Dinner, but it's sort of a, a counter event. It's something yes. you announced even before Trump said that he was not going to participate yes. in any sort of main uh, mothership uh, Correspondence Dinner. Tell me about Well, I assume event. he's coming to ours instead. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay. Now, failing that, what else have you got planned for the night, or how are you I tell thinking you. about that? Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. You have to come. Oh. Okay. <laughs> we don't have your RSVP yet. Oh. Um, <laughs> I thought I did. Um, well, actually, I don't handle the RSVPs, okay. but um, <laughs> <laughs> I do get to delegate something. Right. Um, yes, no, we're having, a, it's going to be, it is a television show. We are going to be filming it um, late afternoon on the day on the 29th of April at Constitution Hall. And then we'll do a quick edit and put it out that night at some hour um, on television. Um, Has the production work already started on it? Or is mm -hmm. it kind of like one of those? Yeah, we sh I, li I watched some stuff today. It was Ooh. beautiful. I'm so <laughs> excited. I wish I could tell you. <laughs> <laughs> There's some really great stuff we shot. Right. So how do you squeeze in <laughs> the time while you're also putting on a show. We do it now. We don't have a show this week. Oh, okay. Week. So, so we took we took a show off the calendar so mm -hmm. that we could do it now because yeah, it, it has been hard doing both mm -hmm. in the in the past few weeks. So now we're Hi, they're yell they're holding up a sign. Yeah, for you. yeah. So we're gonna uh, I think start asking for questions uh, from our, our audience members and I believe the way this is gonna work we have we have yes, we have a gentleman with a microphone and a woman on this end. So if you have a question, if you could please just raise your hand and one of the people with the microphone will come to you and uh, then you can ask the questions directly to the panelists. So let's start on this side. Um, you. Which one? You oh, can you speak? Make sure you okay. please speak into the mic. You were on the campaign trail, right? Uh, Would, yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Were you there when he, when Trump insulted the reporter with the hands? Yes. I was. Because I know someone who's a journalist mm -hmm. who knows the guy with the hands and said that the guy with the hands isn't that insulted. That that he, he it's, it's not it's like a condition and he knows about it and he doesn't get freaked out that that wasn't really like that offensive. Um, I can't speak to that because uh, I don't know Serge personally and I've never spoken to him about it. Um, Maybe. Yeah, no, I'm friends with Serge, and um, the, uh, you know, Serge's attitude about it is he doesn't want to be part of the story, that he's a reporter, and he didn't want uh, the story to become about him, nor did he want um, to get into a right. sort of a tit for tat, you know, with, with Trump. I mean, and I think he never said this, but I think the view, to some extent, the view was the video was shocking enough and kind of spoke, you know, for itself. So, getting into like Trump's memory. I mean, Trump used to say, he said to me twice that 9-11 happened during dinner time. <laughs> this, this is a man who's, you know, the people were eating dinner, you know, when the, when the planes hit. You know, this is, at the very least, what he says that comes out of his mouth is not, you know, so, and that, I, I think Serge was pretty smart in like rising above yeah. and, um, not getting into a memory game, so. We have a question on this side of the room. Seek somebody out. There we go. Uh, this is for Sopan, and I'm sorry, the guy who's Patrick. not in the program. Okay, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> the guest star. Yeah, right. <laughs> you, uh, again, because you were on the on the stump with Trump for so long, people were laughing. He's a gent. He's a comedian. Can he keep them laughing? Is it is that going to be enough? Are they going to keep enjoying the personal connection that he's making his supporters the deeper he goes into his presidency? It's a great question, and I look forward to finding out the answer. And I say I'm not trying to be glib. Um, I think that who saw this coming, right? And 
who saw the personal connection lasting past the primaries, and then to him becoming the nominee, and then to him becoming president. And um, I hesitate to get into the prediction game only because how many times has Donald Trump surprised us all? And so for me, you know, now that he's in office and there are actual stakes, you know, will his supporters stay with him if the coal jobs don't come back? If the swamp isn't drained. Okay, they're coming back. You know? I said they're coming back. But I will say, as someone who talked to hundreds and hundreds of Trump supporters in my year and a half, there is a, there was a sense of, we believe everything he says, you know? Uh, and so does that, is there a shelf life to that? I don't know. Um, I didn't even know there was, that would last throughout the campaign. I don't think any of us did. So I, I don't know the answer to your question is, but is the best answer I can give you. I mean, just briefly, the, I mean, he, during the campaign, he saw his rallies as his sort of number one most effective communication device. So he thought, don't give the policy speeches and stop trying to get me to do overseas trips. Just hold rallies, rallies after mm -hmm. rallies, and because he felt like, them. and he's still holding them. So, so he's lucky, lo that's the best part. I think he, to him, this is like the best part. That's that was the best part. That was the most fun, like, and and they're they can Obama be exhausting. Too. That was his mm -hmm. favorite part too. Like what's it? It was Barack Obama's favorite part too. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he. Not right, like, but Obama would go after off a teleprompter almost always. Mm -hmm. Like Trump would bring his little yellow legal pad sheet. I mean, it ran into some comedians, yeah. you know, and he'd have his topics written out and then he'd get up there. So he had, you know, he had the rallies and he had Twitter. And now that he's president, he has like major real world problems to deal with. And he can't just float on the rallies and the and Twitter forever. We don't know. He's got we d well. He uh, yeah. I, well. His approval rating is in the toilet. I mean, whether <laughs> in, in three years, all these Republicans will still come out and say, mm -hmm. "Okay, now entertain us again," and we'll forget about the last three and a half years. I mean, to soap pants, but we don't know. I mean, the key. Well, a, you're a key not question. an insurgent when you're the sitting president either. Right. There's you know all of that anger at the establishment. Where does it go? Right. But like, I hate to use the word likability because that word was really thrown around uh, in problematic ways around with Hillary Clinton. But let's just say this: it d partly depends, I think, who's running against him. You know, mm -hmm. in three years, and if he's able to be seen, <coughs> you know, as the uh, you know, he makes you. Well, I, I don't think it's not all about laughter and smiles getting elected president of the United States, reelected. But you know, part of it is who is who you're running against. And how you feel about that person versus, you know, Trump? Well, I'm and sure how the Democratic Party will put forth a great candidate. <laughs> <laughs> Who would you like Smooth to see, Joe? Sailing. Who would you like to see? You Is there know, anyone? It, they do not have a deep bench right now. They're right. running 70-year-olds. So um, I'd say whoever is going to be is probably going to surprise us. I mean, you know, but there's a, there's a big age. Gap. There's some up and comers like right. like uh, Chris Murphy, who you know all these um, some some mayors and in in, um, in the Midwest, some really great people at the entry level, and then there's nobody my age, and right. then there's seventy year olds. She's not one good job. <laughs> she's and a dual citizen now, right? I mean, she's eligible. She's a, she's an American citizen. Right. Okay. Yeah, she's not getting quite enough misogynist hate and death threats right. on Twitter yet, so she should definitely run for president. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Like, sometimes you go hours. Right. <laughs> Another question on this side, yes. Well, that was my question. Uh, is it uh, somebody who's funny, like an Al Franken? Is it somebody who's come up on Bill Maher, like, ah, Kellyanne Conway? Right. Um, is it some of the talking heads that are on right now? We didn't think about Obama seven years Went after Bill Clinton got out of office, he wasn't even a blip on anybody's radar. Yeah. So Franken is yeah. a great example. I mean, He's talk about somebody who came, you know, right out of, you know, out of comedy, out mm -hmm. of the comedic establishment, and then used that, you know, I mean, used that as a stepping stone for his two talk radio, and then that became, you know, at least a way to get into politics. Yeah. He has never shown the remotest interest in doing anything but the Senate, yeah. where he's a very effective senator for his state. Um, yeah, it'd be. It'd be fucking great <laughs> to see that debate. <laughs> Man, right. you, could do, you could put that debate on pay-per-view. <laughs> I don't even mean to suggest him as a, as a candidate per se, but as somebody who, 
you know, I, I mean, I've he, suggested yeah. him. <laughs> <laughs> you look at him, you know, look at his weekend update appearances on SNL over the years. You'd never think you'd see that person in the Senate one day. And now, of course, you know, there, I just go back to the, is, the Pepsi uh, syndrome. Right. I mean, he was the mime, remember? Right. In his little, go back and watch the Pepsi syndrome. Right. Uh, Franken and Davis are in their little um, shields and yarn and Nile unitards. And right. I am energy. <laughs> I am a short-sighted consumer. And I was like, Wait, we're mimes. We're not supposed to talk. Right. <laughs> but there's no one on the, the big left. Big Jufro. It's great. Right. Yeah, yeah. No. There's just no one on the left right now in the Democratic political establishment who has the the television skills and the kind of the lack of a better word, charis charisma, charismatic. Mm -hmm. uh, skills that the Trump had as a candidate, let's say that, like early on as a, as a candidate. I mean, the I, I sometimes wonder, is there though a figure like, you know, like a John Stewart or a Stephen Colbert, someone who is outside of like the political establishment? unqualified people. <laughs> well, here's the, but here's the thing, with Trump what it was, was there was the television, incredible sort of like, not incredible, but the, the, communi the specific communication skills that he had with a message. And the message was make America great again. And we're all used to covering campaigns where the, the motto changes at least like three times. And Trump was make America great again from the beginning. And lo and behold, it really sold. Well, it sold was a reporter who people. came up with that. What's that? That was from a reporter. Yeah. He gave it to him. Make America great again? Yeah. You're like, that's so good. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, but that's the thing. I mean, having that kind of blend Reagan, that, you can, really that you can sell. You know, having the blend that you can sell, at least on on the left. I mean, a, a lot of people found Bernie Sanders' message to be very, very powerful, uh, but the messenger, you know, ultimately didn't work as well. And he had, you know, he had the. You've seen people's tattoos. Like, he's <laughs> yeah, not, right. he's not a cult. And I really, I, I, I think if if we're wishing for a charismatic leader on the left or right, then you're gonna regret wishing for that. Like the, the, right. like the messianic figure that people vest all their hope in and then are disappointed by, like that's not, it, president is a job, it's the, it's the head of government, it's not the head of, I mean it's the head of state too, but it's your, these messianic figures are not what we should want. And certainly a messianic figure on the far left to like usher in, Chavismo or something, that's really right. scary. I mean, the uh, uh, right-wing populism is less frightening to me because it, there's actually nothing populist at all about the policies, it's, mm -hmm. it's not really sustainable. Um, whereas left-wing populism is very potent and dangerous, and yes, I've been reading Sinclair Lewis, and like, <laughs> <laughs> it can't happen here, and like, yeah. yeah. I, I don't want a far left-wing populist. I think that would be terrible for the country to have these like charismatic, um, you know, wrestling matches. And the Democrats will have a choice whether they put up someone like that or whether they go the counter-programming route, which is normally how elections are won. You put up someone who is, who is pretty different, who represents a change from, from what you have now. Whether that'll sell and wear well and, you know, excite people. I mean, it's hard to, I mean, it's three and a half years away, you know. It's hard to know how people will feel about yeah. Trump then. Yeah. If we still have elections. Lots of hands down. <laughs> it's sad. Um, now that more people turn to comedy shows and other non-traditional sources of media for their news, do you think that the standards that we hold journalists to are changing, and does that bleed over into comedy? I think they, they no, journalistic standards are journalistic standards. I think a lot of people don't hold <laughs> people to them, but, you know. I, I do think there's something to the point that there are more people getting their news from comedy. You know? I do think there is, I, I do think there are more young people especially getting their news from for, from late night, and which you know, um, but no, I don't. Their news from John and Stephen for years. Right? I just I will always remember when I, I started here in two thousand five, and Arthur Salzberger, Jr., the publisher, used to have these publishers lunches, and Jimmy Carter came in, and uh, Arthur always started uh, it off saying, "Where do you get your news?" And Jimmy Carter said, um, "You know, the New York Times." CNN and The Daily Show. This was like 2005, mm -hmm. I think. And, well, that was sort of the heyday, 2005, 2006. Yeah, yeah. and Arthur, mm -hmm. I don't know how much Arthur was watching The Daily Show necessarily, <laughs> but, John, but he then invited Jon Stewart. And Jon Stewart came in like six months later and Arthur started off by telling this story to, to John. And, you know, it was one of the most memorable lunches I have ever been at because he was such a, smart but incredibly passionate 
kind of critic, and critic in the best sense of, of the times and of the mainstream media. And again, this was, I think, 2006. Mm -hmm. And he spot, one of, the, one of his ideas, the idea that he came in like loaded for bear on, if I'm gonna get this right, he wanted to turn page two, which is sort of the table of contents and where the corrections run. He want, I think what he wanted to do was get rid of all that and have page two was going to be just bannered truth and lies. And it was just going to be this very straight, this is the truth, and then these are the lies. This is like, I'm not going to say fake news, but these are the lies. <laughs> and it was like, and at the time in 2006, it was, you know, it was still like shot, like, oh, we could never do something like that. Da, 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 da. And, but it, the idea had so much power and it stayed with all of us. And it was, I remember when the Times was inching up so closely to using the word lie. With, some, with, with Trump, and when we finally did it with birtherism, and it was really late in the campaign, and it was led the paper, and everybody wrote all the stories, know. finally the Times has used that word, but it was it's, a uh, long, tortured journey to a, get to that. Roger's thesaurus. Of, you know. And, and yeah. just to circle back to the initial, original question, um, no, I don't think our standards are changing or no. lowering at all. No. I mean, and it, I can only speak for like John Oliver and us and The Daily Show. Um, but we maintain really strict fact checking too, mm. and you know, yeah, never single now. source anything, and yeah. always have to, you know, for our own interviews. Um, it's very important. Do, do you guys have uh, people that are specifically hired just as fact checkers? Like that's oh, what yeah. they did. That's what they yeah. do. Just in in the explosion of all these, you know, news sources that have come out, and you know, obviously some with, you know, varying degrees of you know reliability and accuracy. I mean, how do you do you look at them at all? Do you allow them to kind of permeate what you're? What are you talking about? Well, I mean, you know, there's so many new uh, sources of information that that people have started looking at. Let's say just within the last year, especially, yeah. you know, I mean, just through social media. Uh, I mean, do you allow those things to kind of come onto your your radar screen at all? Or everything's on the radar, yeah. yeah. And that's why I think that fewer people than ever are getting their news from comedy shows, like when. It, when it was just John and Stephen, a lot of young people got their news from John and Stephen. They were on every night, and there was a lot of there. Now people have Twitter, people have social media. They're on their feeds all day long. They're getting their news from their social media, so, um, and so are we to some <laughs> extent. <laughs> Vicky, question on this side. Well, I'm a big fan of Full Frontal. And um, one of the reasons is because there aren't many women doing what Samantha B does. I mean, she's probably the only one with their with a regular comedic news show out there. Yeah, it's because women aren't funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question to you is, um, when you're writing the show, do you um, consider the fact that she's the only woman out there doing what she does, and do you pick your news stories or? write your jokes or make your presentations with a specific point of view that maybe a woman would have? Well, fun fact, mm. I am also a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I had noticed. <laughs> so it, it, it uh, and so are a lot of our writers and a lot of our staff. So the, it, it is not a conscious thing. It, it's natural that there are things that resonate with us that are of interest to us that like shoot through our gut like a cannonball that maybe a man wouldn't even register. And so that's how that stuff gets on the show. And Sam and I are up at five texting each other about it. <laughs> so hire more women. <laughs> I think most of the questions seem to be concentrated here. So yeah, next question. Um, hi, uh, I have a question. So uh, you talked a lot about Donald Trump. Um, I was thinking about Hillary Clinton, who has been, you know, often criticized as not being spontaneous or funny enough. Um, but I actually do find her to carry her own brand of humor uh, that is rather dry sometimes mm -hmm. yeah. uh, when it comes out. Um, how do you, com if, if you agree with that, uh, how do you compare Hillary Clinton's style of humor with Trump's? How do you compare these two brands of humor? Uh, I, I so the easy question for the end, okay. I do, <laughs> yeah. I do agree right, with it. you. Um, I, I agree with you, I mean, and, and to, 
we all know how locked down she is and behind a phalanx and so careful about her messaging after you know decades and decades of being crushed every time she steps out of line or is spontaneous. Um, I, I do think she's witty. I am. I think we used to see it more when she was Secretary of State and every time she'd leave America and just let her hair down and have fun. Um, you'd see it in the, uh, in the, especially people who know her. And like you were saying, people look to the emails to see her, her personality there. And it's rather charming. Um, it's quieter. Um, and it's not all there is. I think that's that's also it's not, a big you know thing. performance isn't all there is. Right. With she's art. you know that side that you just talked about. I mean, she's also you can't discuss a complicated policy issue like criminal justice reform while being sardonic and and, and, and witty. And um, so whereas with Trump, <laughs> no, I, I, you know, and this is not a knock or uh, a praise of Trump in any way, but he is that side of him that like boisterous. Um, you know, I'm an entertainer side of him was just more prevalent. It was just there more. He saw himself as much of an entertainer as he saw himself as a politician. Whereas with Hillary Clinton, you know, that dry, you know, witty side that you reference, we, pro we didn't see as often as we saw with Trump. You know, we just didn't, we just didn't. And part of that, of course, is she didn't campaign as much. I, I would have liked to see it more, yeah, you're right. And in the last two months of the campaign, Trump was doing five, six rallies a day, you know? I mean, not six, but four or five a day. She, you know, Hillary well, Clinton. To be fair, the Parkinson's made it hard for her to get out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she also. She did her best. There, there was a there was a straitjacket that she put either was in or put herself in. I mean, her campaign in both 2008 and 2016 was very worried that her that her sense of humor wouldn't sell well widely. She was dry. She was witty. I found her. I always enjoyed her humor the most when she was sort of sarcastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that there was I, I will always remember. In 2008, by far my best experience with her, we had this off-the-record dinner, her and the editor of the Times, Bill Keller, and myself and Adam Nagurney, the political reporter, and she had, you know, she likes to drink, and she had some wine, and she was just so funny, and it was driving, and it was, she was, she, it was a completely, I mean, I felt so honored to be there, and I had a lot of gratitude for it, but it was also such a puzzle, because you sort of saw this, this person but the reality is, I mean, we go through life wearing so many different faces, you know, in, in the workplace. I'm, I'm a white man who I feel a lot of freedom, frankly, to act certain ways. Mm -hmm. I just do. I don't, I'm not She would have been crucified. She would have been that? crucified. She would have been crucified. You think this is a joke? You think this is funny? Yeah. yeah. Right. We're and talking, her folks. Uh, like and the, the focus group thinks you're a cunt. Yeah. Right, you know, like, right. And she and, her, she and her team knew it. They knew, I mean, that's what they said. They said sarcasm will not sell in Iowa in a mm -mm. competitive field against Barack Obama, this handsome, charming guy, and John Edwards, this you know, handsome, charming guy. <laughs> and, uh, and, then in, and then in 2016, she was just fricasseed right out of the gate with the email stuff. And she just was, it was seen by her campaign. She couldn't be light and funny because it was like she was a criminal. You know, half the country. And also, the any woman running for president has to run as Margaret Thatcher in this country. You well, have to be the Iron Lady. But, but that was the 2008 idea that she had to prove that she had bigger balls than Obama and Edwards together. That was the mantra inside the campaign. She had to be like, absolutely, like Margaret Thatcher, like ready mm -hmm. to. And in 2016, they decided she needed to be more human, but the way to do that was the grandmother stuff, which was like. <laughs> You know, <laughs> but what no. about the, the Al Smith dinner, though? I mean, that she was, was very yeah, funny. Was yeah. And late. that was, you know, I mean, we've talked about how funny, you know, Trump is or the the charisma that he had. But for, I mean, if that if that were just a, you know, if that were a scored event, I mean, it seemed clear that she, she won that. Yeah, she had the delivery, and he did. And obviously, I think she was, yeah, he had was one late. jab at his wife. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> it was late in the campaign, yeah. and she felt very confident. And she was in New York, and she felt. But it, that was the thing, you know. Yeah. You go out to Iowa and there's uh, New Hampshire, those states that really matter, and um, and you know they would become these versions. They'd become politicians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Still have time for questions? Yes. Okay. Right in the back. 
I got nothing to do. Okay. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> We've been talking about the impact of political comedy and satire in the US. And apart from Basim Yusuf, who's the Egyptian John Stewart, I'd be interested to know why you think this genre of TV hasn't been more popular in other countries. Well, no, Charlie Brooker's Weekly Wife was quite popular. I, mean, I watched it. I can see. <laughs> and, and also, in some government, it's not allowed. Right. You know, yeah. I mean, there's mm -hmm. the, there are some very repressive regimes where comedians. You know, I have. Um, you know, Middle Eastern comedian friends who say, you know, when they do stand up there, they have to like, there are certain things they cannot joke about. You mm -hmm. cannot insult the government. You cannot insult, you can't talk about sex. You know, you can't talk about, you know, there's a list of things you can't touch. So that's partially it. But I mean, this exists in, yeah. right? I mean, this exists in. We've had, we had people from various countries come to visit The Daily Show to sort of spend a week with us and see mm. how we produce things. Um, people from. Um, do you ever send anybody abroad? Like to see what other satirists are doing around. I'm just curious. Now we make Boston come to us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Except no, Sarah Taxler did go and make a documentary about him there. Mm -hmm. so, um, he kind of stole John Oliver away. I mean, he he was kind of uh, you know mm -hmm. having. I mean, he sort of had a decent to middling career in Britain, mm -hmm. and then came over here and just kind of. Uh, you know. He still does the soccer podcast. Right. <laughs> 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 Okay, sorry, I'm told this is going to be our last question, so, okay, this one. And it better be great. <laughs> no pressure, man. Uh, I'll do my best. First off, uh, Joe, love the t-shirt. Um. Yeah, my, my writer, Melinda Taub, went to Mexico over the break last week and attended a wrestling That's event awesome. and bought me this. It's, there's a lot going on so I have in this shirt. I could stare at this for hours. Tremendous. Um, I've been I've been a big proponent of the idea that good comedy requires empathy, and the uh, the Huckabee Joe kind of you know the whole the pretty 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 aspect to it really kind of drives down how there's a real there's a real dearth of empathy on the on, I guess most public you know politicians in general but especially on the Republican side. I just um, wanted to maybe hear your thoughts on that and also if you could probably give an idea of who is coming up presidential candidate who has that kind of empathy to really reach out to people. Um, I think you out. should take the you should take the fir uh, first crack at comedians whether they require empathy or not. Um, yes, I mean yes, I think so. Um, and there's there's always a lot of talk about why is there you know why isn't there any conservative comedy? Why aren't there conservative comedy shows that succeed? Now, obviously, it's because the Jew liberal media <laughs> keeps them out. Um, so that's the answer to that. Uh, we just, we've got a bar, like it's a velvet rope. It's like, no, you, you, you think abortion is murder, go away. Um, but I think there, there, are, there are formats for, uh, that, that are more, the like comedy is well suited to um, perhaps, you know, centrist, left of center comedy um, that has empathy or whatever. Uh, and, but there are things that, that liberals do terribly, for instance, um, AM radio, or, you know, remember, uh, you know, in, when Air America who, came on to try to Who's the most be, famous liberal AM radio host right now? Right now? I can't, I can't. I mean, I just remember Air America, and that, yeah. that didn't. Who? Hmm? I, I don't know who that is. Yeah. Aaron Hunter? Aaron. Karen Aaron Hunter. Okay. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know who that is. Um, and, they're, you know, they're bad, they're not good at the, you know, Mm, um, Tom Hartman, I think that's, yeah. At the anger that is mm. the, the currency of that medium. So, um, you know, the, you know diff different, different media are suited to different political stripes, I guess. That's what I'm saying. I have no idea who's coming up. Like, no I mean, one leaps out. I mean, again, yeah. Murphy. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Murphy, Chris Murphy from Connecticut. I mean, in terms of first tier, Candace. I mean, the 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 some to watch. I mean, the attorney general in Washington State who filed early on the travel visa ban. I mean, someone who, you know, who who was able to articulate in like a human and an intellectual way, like why something was so was such a violation of of who who we are as Americans. I mean that. You know, there was pa there was a lot of passion there. Um, I'd like to see Vanita Gupta run for something. Yeah. Out of DOJ, she used to have the DOJ mm, the civil, civil rights, rights division yeah. before she was replaced by the guy who defended the bathroom 
uh, the transgender bathroom ban. Yeah. Um, she's got a real personal story mm. and a passion for what she does. I mean, there are good many people who felt that Joe Biden had that. Oh, know? yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And, you know, he certainly hasn't closed the door to I, it. Um, I think that young man's got a future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in answer to the first part of your question, uh, you know, the notion of whether it's required for comedians of empathy, um, I think all comedians or performers really have to care genuinely about the audience they're in front of. Even insult comics care about the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's, uh, you know, I think that if you're genuine, if you're just being mean spirited, you lose the audience. You know, I've seen that at shows mm -hmm. where someone is just being a jerk for the sake of being a jerk. Mm -hmm. And that you, when, once you lose the room, you're just not getting them back. And so, but, but you're performing in front of a crowd that's paid to see you. You know, so you're not getting anything out of not caring about them. You're performing for them. You're hoping to take their minds off things. So one, I think 100%, there needs to be some level of genuine connection with the people that you're in front of. Thank you for uh, being empathetic to us for the past <laughs> hour and 15 minutes. And one big round of applause for our panelists, Jill Miller, Sophia Dam, Patrick Healy.